Welcome back to more of the Final Fantasy XII Rediscovery Run. We defeated a large bomb in the area over there and saw the Necrol of Nabodis and Nebraeus Deadlands for the first time. Also explored this very relaxing, peaceful forest. And now, we're gonna go through this relaxing, peaceful for it and forest and kill some rare animals here! So the first one of these is in the Corridor of Ages. And there... This one's a little bit weird. So, it has a 20% chance of spawning every time you enter and exit the area. However, there is one, um, one caravan. It's invisible. Oh, we got some, uh, Gishol greens from that Chocobo. The thing about those greens is they've been in pretty much every Final Fantasy game that has Chocobos, but the actual place that they're named after is specific to one of the games. I think it was the one that, that Chocobos first showed up in? Which I want to say was FF3? Ah! You might be able to see something there. Yeah. There's a toad looking thing here, and we can even rub against it. But it's invisible. Now we can't directly target it either, because it's invisible. Even though we can sort of see it if we're looking closely enough. There are a few ways to deal with this thing and make it visible again. Well, make it visible in general. The first is to lure another enemy to where it is, and then it will attack them and reveal itself. The second is to cast Reflect, and then bounce a spell off of yourself. That's what I'm going to try here, except you don't have Reflect. Okay, Balthea has Reflect, so if Ash were to, say, cast Fire on Balthea... Yep, that revealed it. There it is, the Wood Toad. Or, um... In Japanese, this thing is called Sneak Frog. Or Sneak Frog. Which is kind of funny. I guess this thing is uh, meant to be sort of a reference to certain animals that use natural camouflage or things like that. Seems to be weak to electricity. And it does do quite a lot of damage. But it is slowed and hopefully we finish this thing off. Fran's going to cure her. Actually, somebody's healing it. Is it Bolfir who's healing it? He's the only one I can think of who'd be healing it. Either that or it's healing itself. Yeah, nobody's healing it anymore. Oh, wait, of course. Kura is bouncing off my reflects and healing it because I am dumb. Always gotta keep an eye on that kind of thing. But it is down now. Overall, that's a very interesting idea for a rare game. And boing. <laughs> the next rare game is in the Sun Dappled Path. This one has a 15% chance of spawning every time you kill a wild hare. In fact, I actually think I just equipped both these worm fire shot as well. So that's going to make this a little bit easier, unless I didn't. Nope, I just took it off. Well, that was, uh, overkill. Look at this cluster of weird hairs. Not a care in the world. Not knowing that they're about to be burned. That, I think that should be it. This thing is... SPEE! <laughs> it has such a stupid name, but I'm gonna dispel those buffs, um, first. <laughs> it's just such a funny name for, for an enemy. SPEE! <laughs> Oh, Wolfie yeah. is confused. It hurt Fran in confusion. Uh, it's the it's the sand that cures confusion, isn't it? <laughs> and 
Now Balthea shall return the favor. Hopefully before Vaan hits him in the face. Because if Vaan hits him in the face, he might get... Oh, he didn't actually get slowed. It's a pretty nice um, combo attack rate on this uh, ninja sword that has... Oh, Hero's March. Well, yeah, we know what that does now. <laughs> Basically gives you every buff. Which can be dispelled, thankfully. I don't think you ever get access to Hero's March. It would be kind of overpowered. Oh, it's casting Berserk too. Although that's probably a bad thing for you. Berserking who is my main physical attacker right now. Yep, there it goes. And all it's worth is a piece of drab wool. And an entry in our um, in our bestiary. And that's really the main thing that matters. I thought there'd be a cutscene here. Witness the power of you who are actually motivated now, finally. It's a good shot of the wood there. And this will lead us out of the woods and into the beach. Okay, the Serobi Step. That place is interesting. I guess all of them are going there now. Oh, that's not a place you want to be assigned to. A sash. Some of the locals not so pretty. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. I seem to remember the sash actually did something pretty good. Half damage, fire, immune, slow. That's alright. Yeah, we'll sort those out when we're a bit stronger, don't worry. Moss for a high waist. Okay, so I guess you're all splitting up. And some of them are going to the Serobi Step. So this path will lead us to the Fon Coast, but before we go, we have some LP to spend. I'm a little bit overdue for this, so let's let's get to this. We're starting to get some of the higher tiered accessories, so I might want to actually go on a bit of an accessory license getting spree. Especially since we got a lot of new ones lately that we can't really use without the very high level licenses. Oh, Bubble Belt. Bubble Belt gives you permanent bubble status, which is really fun. Although with how easy it is to cast that, it's not like super necessary or anything. Guess I can give you access to it though. Yeah, the sash requires accessories 18. I think we're very behind on our accessory licenses, so that might be the theme of a lot of this. Also, okay, you need measures 3 to use the caliper. Having uh, access to measures on Mechanus and pretty much nothing else at least gives Mechanus a bit of a niche. And unfortunately, this is basically as far as Fran goes when it comes to magic, other than... Um, Ardor, which is not until way later in the game. And also has a pretty long animation, so it's not as efficient as some of the other types of spells. Like, I hear that, um, Black Mages with the high-tier, non-elemental Black Magic spell are overall better than the Archer-Red Mage combo. It's one of those... One of those things that's a bit of a berserk button in the community because a lot of people think it's more overpowered than it actually is. I mean, I get why people are annoyed at things like that. It, it's why, I guess, some people talk about crit healing in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, like, oh yeah, crit healing is so amazing, and then people have to say it's not actually the most objectively good build in the game. It's still really, really good for getting through the game normally, but it's just, yeah. I can see why the more experienced players get mad at stuff like that. And get the high tiers of, of stars, staves, whatever. Yes, you can grab the thing that I actually got your quickening for. And then finally, Pinello. Maybe, again, more accessories, I, I guess? Yeah, the accessories are in a little bit more of a convenient place to access on this license board. 
I've always liked the name of that crossbow, Ga Gastrophetes, or anyone. I've always liked the name of it, and I can't say it. And the Cadio hood is really expensive, but it might be useful a bit later on. And yep, that is that is all of those uh, LP spent. I feel like I haven't used Control Bash in a little while. So onward to the beach. It would seem we made the right choice. If we'd taken the easy way and come by airship, one of those patrols would no doubt have been quick to roll out the red carpet. We're on the Empire's doorstep now, so we shouldn't have to worry quite so much. But that's no excuse to get sloppy. It is still a long road to the capital. Oh, I remember this song now! Very triumphant sounding for a beach area. But it does really give you that feeling of, you know, we're right on the Empire's doorstep, we're close to our destination. Kind of. We still have the um the uplands to go through and one more place. So a sleeping Mandragora. Who dies in one hit? Silver Lobo. Oh, I remember those things. Oh yeah, I do remember this music now. I mean, Seville might think it's a little bit unfitting for an area like this. It actually reminds me a little bit of like a level song from a um, like a platform game or something. Or oh, not really. It's a bit too trumpety for that, I suppose. That's a weird word. But maybe the reason why this um music is so sort of upbeat is because. The Phone Coast was actually the site of one of um, this game's demos. This game had two demo, uh, well, one demo that had a choice of two areas. One of them was the Still Shrine of Miriam, which was on um, active battle mode, and the other was the Phone Coast, which was which was on wait battle mode. And the Phone Coast, you had a bit of like a mini mission to defeat a certain number of sleep nears, and then a T Rex enemy called the Rock Eater would show up, which is just a renamed version of a certain enemy from the. Um, from the um, higher leveled area of the mines, I think. The, of the henna mines, I mean. I'm gonna preemptively put the spear so I can hopefully hit this thing. Also, Fran should be Libring. I do also remember there is a pretty major cutscene in the middle of the Fon Coast. Level 35. Okay, we actually are a little, despite going through some optional areas before heading to this part of the game, we are actually a little bit under level, which is kind of surprising me. Uh, oh yeah, she's really far behind, that's why the Cure Arca wasn't going off. This area reminds me a little bit of a beach uh, place in... Um, Let's actually switch over to a sword again. Oh no, there are more flying enemies. I might as well keep the spear even though it's weaker. In Tales of Exilia, it's one of the earlier areas, and I don't think it has nearly as dramatic music as this. It's sort of more of a calm kind of music. But I do actually remember the Fonpos being a fairly big area. And it's also the site of something that is actually like one of the consequences of a quest that we did earlier, the Earth Tyrant. It'll, I don't know if it gives us direct access to anything, but the NPC for that shows up here. Wow, there's a lot of enemies in this screen. Oh, and also one of the guy dang it chests of doom is here. Oh, speaking of which, the, the Zodiac Spear chest, the one that you despawn if you touch any of the guy dang it chests of doom, that is in the Necrol of Nabudis. Um, if you're really good at stealthing past enemies, you can get 
This, I believe, is the earliest point in the game where you can actually know, because I think you can. Once the ferry starts working in the Dalmasca Easter Sand, can you actually go to the Salika Wood then? Because if you can, then you would be able to go to the Necrol of Nupperdies then and get the Zodiac Spear that early. Yeah, the Zodiac Spear is actually like a... You can, you can get it really early if you know what you're doing, but not if you touch any of the Guide Dang It Chests of Doom. So one of the Guide Dang It Chests of Doom is in here, but it's definitely the most obvious Chest of Doom, and you'll, you'll see why once we get to it. All right! Holy Begoli! The Begolis are back! This is why the Begolis were in an area called Question Mark in my, um, in my bestiary. Not my bestiary, it's not specific to me or anything, but in the bestiary. That makes sense, it's because they're Fon Coast enemies. And we hadn't been here yet. I do kind of remember a lot of these areas underneath rock formations, and... Getting a bit of a slight fallen arm vibe from this place too. It's just, yeah, super dramatic music though. But again, I suppose it fits, and I also love how Bolthia, again, in that, um, in that cutscene, he was bringing up the criticism that a lot of people have. Like, oh, why don't they just fly the airship to Arcades? Uh, it's almost, and, and also people are like, oh, like, there's no plot or character development in all of this exploration on the way to Arcades. Well, um, that's actually where you're wrong, but, um, well, we'll get into that, um, a little later. Game Hunter. Oh, okay, yeah, that does look like a Chocobo-only path. So yeah, there's a Hunter's Camp here, and that... That, I think, is what gives you access to a certain thing that's gonna open up a whole lot of rare game stuff, and I think in this version is how you get the Zodiac Spear. Yeah, we are certainly taking a lot of damage from the enemies in these areas, despite only being a few levels below them. Ironically, these flying things that look really scary, like their mouths are like mostly teeth, actually, they just die to blizzard, they're really not that bad. Now, I'm not sure where that camp would be. Again, this is a very big area, and I don't really want to be going too far without discovering the camp, because I think the camp is where the cutscene is. And the cutscene is something that's very, very, uh, important. To various... various important things. Yes, importance to important things. Oh look, here's another one of these pathetic flyers that don't really do much. Double Blizzard from, well, the, the, the Red Mage, Black Mage combo. I was about to say Double Black Mage, but I wish. Red Mage did help out a bit early on, but it, it does feel like it's a little bit of a crutch class. In that it's super useful early in the game, and I think it's actually what a lot of speedrunners use, but um, it definitely starts falling off a bit once you get access to higher level spells, which I think is sort of a thing of the Red Mage. It can do a little bit of everything, but it also, you know is not the greatest at everything, it's merely like mid-tier at every type of magic, and in some games it's good at physical attacking too. In Bravely Default it has that ability that's super annoying on enemies where um, you have a random chance of gaining BP whenever you get hit, which when you're fighting a boss that you hit tons of times in order to defeat them, it's a little bit of an issue. I guess we should just try and let sleeping toads lie. Is that an... Oh, Banga Pirate! Yeah, of course they're aggressive. I think that's what the Moogles were warning us about regarding, um... Regarding, uh, the denizens here not being very friendly. We're starting to encounter more aggressive members of various humanoid races, like, like the aggressive Sikhs that were in the, um in the Mosferon Highways. This is definitely a more treacherous part of the world. But it at least is an excuse to get those types of enemies in our bestiary without having to kill friendly uh, NPCs. I don't know if you ever fight aggressive Gareth though, because they would have an entry in the bestiary too. 
And yeah, I really don't want to have to kill the friendly ones that sometimes show up in the Osmo plane. But I am glad that there are, again, like, antagonistic banger here that we can use to get them in our beast area without having to team kill. Yeah, that's another frog. I don't remember there being anything particularly amazing in the treasure chest in the Fon Coast either. Just a very, very big expansive area with um, a lot of enemies that are... I mean, these are enemies that die quickly but also hit hard, so it's sort of a glass cannon region in a way. But I do really want to get to that camp because that's when the scene that I really want to see is. So I do definitely remember that. Okay, gonna stay here for the Cura. Having like one brutal physical attacker in Barsh combined with two mages to keep him healthy with white magic is, is a decent setup for a party as well. And we are here at um, another cape. Of course you can probably just use magic on these things and not wake them up at all. music is still is still pretty nice. I believe in the Still Shrine of Miriam demo, um, like you have access to one Esper for both of the demos, and in the Still Shrine of Miriam you have um, uh, Belias on Ash, and in the Fon Coast demo you have an Esper on Vaan that I can't talk about yet, because it's a story Esper that we haven't found yet and we won't actually find for a long, long time. So yeah, that's a little bit unfortunate. <laughs> Like, I mean, if I said the name, it wouldn't really mean anything to you out of context, but I still want to keep it as a surprise for later on. It was actually an Esper that I gave to Vaan on my first playthrough, so <laughs> that works out pretty well. I still can't remember who I gave Zalera to, though. Like, again, I do have this feeling that it was maybe Bolfia, but I could be wrong about that. There's, there's that big expansive ocean out there, and unlike the Sand Sea, it's an actual ocean. Are we getting close to the camp? I feel like the camp is going to be—it's going to be obvious when we're approaching it. Looks like there's some ruins out in the middle there. It's usually the middle areas that tend to be camps or save point areas, but it doesn't look like this is one of them. I think this is really just like a huge expanse of areas that just crisscross onto each other. I just still have to keep this spear equipped just in case a uh, flying enemy shows up. Or, you know, I could just not use Barsh and um, uh, Pinello. Oh, I'll bring Pinello in. So I don't find her being like lower level. I feel like once I get haste, I'll be using her more. And in fact, I should probably look up at this point where you get haste because if it was a chest spell that I missed, I'm going to be very annoyed. But I don't know if they'd make such a good effect as haste, something that you can only find in a chest. Because haste is like one of the best um, effects in the whole game. And pretty much any FF game, haste is just absolute god tier of a spell. I still find it really, really fun in the... Yeah, sorry if I'm using the speed up a lot here, it's because these areas are really big and I just kind of want to find the camp and go through them. But, um, in FF10 where they just... You can just kind of go crazy with, um, turn order in that game with haste. You just get it bajillion turns. It's just like the Trails games when you have high speed. Yeah, the Trails battle system is very similar to Final Fantasy X, with the exception of Air Sprays. It's a pretty good system overall. Yeah, I, I got some comments recently on, um, I, I left a comment ages ago on, um, extra credits video on, um, Japanese versus Western RPGs, and, um, it's kind of funny, this is kind of a sign of how trends change, because 
they were basically ragging on, oh, they, they were just, again, just turn-based combat doomers, where they were just all like, oh, turn-based combat is just pointless, and everything should be action-based, and, and, um, I just left a comment saying, I really don't think turn-based combat is inherently bad. Like, they praised Persona, and that uses turn-based combat. So, um, yeah. And I still just, like, I was okay with the first two videos in their JRPGs versus WRPG series in talking about... But then the third video was like, they spend the whole video talking about how um, Japanese RPGs and Western RPGs are two completely different genres, and comparing them is like comparing apples and oranges. And then in the last video, they compare them, and then they also just say, just do a whole thing of like, why Western RPGs are crushing Japanese RPGs? Because we actually have taste, and people who like JRPGs don't. Yeah, it's just more of that. I, I won't get into that, I'd probably get too, too negative, but the thing I was talking about about the changing, changing times is that now there's a huge ton of comments that are all just saying, look, uh, you guys are spouting crap about turn-based RPGs being inherently bad, because there's been a bit of a swing back towards turn-based RPGs now. Oh great, now we reach the Hunter's Camp, right, when I was on a roll with a, a big tangent, I was just like, okay, we're going to be exploring a large expansive area, so I'm going to be going on a tangent now, and then, welp, we reach the camp. Well, I'm not sure exactly when the cutscene is going to trigger up. Thank you, game. <laughs> Thank you, timing. <sighs> oh yeah, this is the really big cutscene I was talking about. Why the capital? The Nethysite. I must destroy it. Are you sure? You don't want it for yourself? <gasps> Use its power to restore Dalmasca? Something like that? The best intentions invite the worst kind of trouble. Lusting for ever greater power. Blinded by the Nethysite. Is that how you see me? That does sound like someone I know. He was obsessed with Nethysite. It was all he cared about. Come over here. He'd here. babble nonsense, hey! blind to aught but the Watch stone's it. power. Like I said, He'd talk about some Enna, or was it Venna? No matter. Thank you. Everything he did, he did to get closer to the Nethysite, to understand it. He made airships, weapons, he even made me a judge. You were a judge? Part of a past I'd rather forget. It didn't last long. I ran, I left the judges, and him. Sidolphus Demon Bonazza. Draclaw Laboratory's very own Dr. Sid. That's when he lost his heart to Nethysite. Lost himself. And I suppose that's when I lost my father. <sighs> Don't follow in his footsteps. I ran away. I couldn't stand seeing him like that, slave to the stone. So I ran. Free at last. Funny I went for the Dusk Shard. How could I have known that it was Nethysite? And then, of course, I met you. All that running, and I got nowhere. It's time to end this. Cut my ties to the past. It's hard to leave the past behind, I know. A marriage of convenience, a symbol of the alliance between Nebradia and Elmasca. This is how they see our marriage. They do, do they? 
these roles we play. I must admit, I find it wearying. I will play mine. I would have no other. The choice is yours to make. But don't give your heart to a stone. You're too strong for that, Princess. I... I pray you're right, Balthier. And that... That's why I made Balthier a knight as his secondary class. The fact that he used to be a judge. I, I wanted to, um, even though he wants to get away from that past, I wanted to reference that because, yeah, and I also think it's it's a bit of a deliberate choice because gameplay-wise, Balthier's actually pretty good in that class. And I think that is intentional. It's a nod to the fact that he used to be one. And also, yep, Dr. Sid is Balthier's father. So, yeah, more reveals there. That's a place we'll be going to a bit later, but... I want to talk a little bit about that cutscene as we go through here. So people are like, yeah, there's no character development during this whole part of the game. Well, yeah, there definitely is. Balthier's biggest character moment for so far. In fact, one of the biggest ones in the whole game. And something that I actually also think is really interesting. I love the fact that... Uh, oh, there's a Chocobo uh, shop here, but um, they're really expensive here. I love the fact that in that cutscene, when Ash was talking to her fiancé, notice how different her voice sounded. It was much higher, and sort of, it sounded much more... It's hard to describe, but it sounded a lot less... She has a much sort of more deeper tone, and more of a hardened, like, world-weary tone of voice now. She sounded much more, I guess, innocent then. That, that's, that's how I describe her tone of voice. And I, I, I like that touch there. Okay, so I'm guessing we need to hunt more, because uh, I know that there is a hunt club here. And the hunt club is how you get access to some, some new rare game in a lot of areas. Also, there's a board here. Is there anything new? Nothing new, just the hunts that we already have. The weird thing is, a lot of guides recommend going back and getting some optional espers now, like partway through the Fon Coast. I just feel like that's a very weird time to be going and doing side quests, especially in the midst of this part of the plot. So I think I won't be- I'll be holding off on side stuff for a little while. At least until we get to Arcades. So yeah, that Hunt Club. I'm not sure when we can actually do stuff with the Hunt Club, but it's- it's important for something. Also, I believe that after the, um, the Earth Tyrant quest, that the guy who got you to go after the Earth Tyrant appears here. So we're talking about this, uh, this cave place. But, um, another thing that I can mention that is not related to anything that happened here in that cast- Actually, maybe, is this the guy? Realistic man. Hmm, yeah, well, I mean, you gotta, I guess, stay hydrated while you're on a coastal area like this, but I did find out that haste is, in fact, in a chest. You can't buy it. And it's a chest we actually could have had for a while. It's at, um, Ayut Village. And because of that, I think I might actually just teleport there. I think, I think a teleport stone is worth it if it means getting haste. Well, two teleport stones to go there and back. I need to find out how to, like, buy those, but... It's in the Fane of the Path, apparently. It's here somewhere. Oh, 
Aha! Uh -huh. I must not have noticed it, because the chest... Yeah, I haven't seen a chest that looks like that before. But, we have it now. We have... Well, I don't know if it's like the best spell in the game in this one, but it is one of my favorite Final Fantasy spells. There it is, haste. And only Penelo can use that. That's gonna give her a lot more use. In fact, I'm gonna make that part of her normal like set of gambits, because haste is just that good. Moral of this story, explore towns a lot. And on that note, I think I'll leave things here because the Fon Coast is a, it's a very big area and we still have quite a lot more of it to go through. So I'm going to split it up into two parts. We'll be heading through the rest of the Fon Coast next time. Still a way to go until Arcades, but our journey there will continue then. So see you all for that.